Thank you, Jesus. Well, amen. We're again, welcome to the house of God. Praise God. We're going to be uh, starting off with Malachi chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 3 in the ESV version, if you don't mind. I titled my message this morning, Refiner's Fire and Fuller's Soap. Uh, you know, well, I'm not going to get into who it was, but, it, but about a about a week, I prepared, I had the thought for this message about two weeks ago. And then last week, I heard a prophecy. I didn't realize it was a prophecy at first, but afterwards I did realize it. And it was talking about praise and it was talking about, and, and so it said, this, this is what was said. You give me a sacrifice and every time you give me a sacrifice, I will refine that sacrifice. I am refining my bride and refining my church and preparing her for myself. And so I've already had this a message about the refiner's fire and the fuller's soap in my heart and in my mind whenever I heard that later. And I didn't even realize that all these things were working together until I began to further study and begin to look at the message. So in Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it's talking about Jesus. So Malachi, if you don't understand, it's the last book of the Old Testament before the 400 years of what we call silence. There was 400 years of prophetic silence. Silence from the time that Malachi prophesied until Zechariah, John the Baptist's father was burning incense in his in his course of uh, time to serve as a, as a Levite, a uh, Levitical priest, and the spirit of prophecy came back upon Zechariah and he began to speak forth and he prophesied about his son John the Baptist, but <clears throat> Malachi actually prophesied that John the Baptist would come, and this is speaking specifically about John the Baptist and about about Jesus and he said behold I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight behold he is coming says the Lord of hosts but who can endure the day of his coming who can stand when he appears for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that you would use me as a mouthpiece this morning to be able to speak forth the truth of what you want spoken, Lord God, regarding the refiner's fire and the fuller's soap. Lord God, I pray that you would just simply use me, Lord, as a mouth that you can speak through this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. He said he was going to refine the sons of Levi. Amen. And if you don't know a lot about the Old Testament, the sons of Levi were the priestly tribe. And they were the ones that offered up the sacrifices. But there were times in Israel's history whenever the Levites or the priests did not do what God was wanting them to do. They went after idolatrous practices. They left the ways of God. And even Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 5 said a, a horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesied falsely and the priests bear rule according to their own authority. And my people love to have it so. And so the people during that time frame liked what the prophets were saying. The people during that time frame liked the way that the priests were handling their business. And I fear, I fear, and I've been preaching this way for quite some time, so anybody that's been coming to this church, you already know that. I'm, I fear that the condition of the church is very similar to the time frame of the idolatrous practices of the nation of Israel, and that church has become a social gap Gathering. Church has become a, a place where words are spoken that tickle the ears and we were warned that those kinds of things were going to happen in the last days. 
We were warned that in the last days that people would, they would depart from the faith and that they would give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And people are always looking for something else to try to fill the holes that are in their heart and, and they're not reaching out and truly submitting their lives to Jesus and letting him have his way. The word of God says in the book of Revelation chapter 5 that Jesus redeemed us with his blood and that he has made us to be kings and priests unto our God. So just as the Levites were priests, I'm here to tell you that if you are a true born again Christian this morning, the word of God says you're a priest. I'm not talking about the kind that walks around with a collar. A priest provides intercession. A priest provides Ministry. God has called you. Listen, you get tired of worshiping this morning? I got some news for you, my friend. Jesus is going to be exalted in heaven. Praise God. The word of God says that the seraphim are around the throne and they're crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And listen, all heaven and earth will, will give him his glory. Amen. And the word of God says that every jointed creature, everything that has knees is going to bow to him and everything that has a tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I don't know where you've been in your journey. I don't know. I don't even know some of them. But I'm here to tell you right now, now is not the time to keep shrinking back. If you ever had a time in your life where you had love for God on the inside of your heart, now is the time to lower yourself if you've been full of pride. What does pride look like? Rebellion against God. Did you know that rebellion is a sin of witchcraft? When we rebel against God and we refuse to humble ourselves under his mighty hand and instead we do our own thing and go our own way, we are practicing the sin of witchcraft. That's what God said. It's not what I said. That's his word. And, and listen, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna, I hope I don't embarrass you. I don't think you're watching me whenever I worship. I don't think you, you, you got better things to do. Amen. You got, you're worshiping the Lord. But I'm telling you right now, I kind of hope I do irritate some people. I hope it irritates people whenever I care, if I care across down the road and I witness Jesus. I hope it shakes some stuff up. I hope it provokes me, not because I'm trying to irritate people. I, I would rather people like me. But if, but if worshiping God extravagantly or living for God out loud in public provokes people and irritates them, well then hallelujah, I believe that I'm probably doing what the Lord has called me to do. Because I'm here to tell you, life as usual ain't going to get it done, my friend. Jesus deserves glory. He deserves honor. He deserves worship and it's time for us to break out of the mold you know look i remember one time i went preached at a church in markville they, they licensed me with the assemblies of god and you made a mistake to give me a book with every assembly of god pastor's name and number in it i started calling them guys up i know it was probably the flesh but nevertheless i was like i got a message and then i called every one of them up dude after a while i knew that they, oh, they had been warned by their friends but i got 13 people to let me in their church and me and danielle went to to this place in marksville it is what it is you did it brother i don't think you're watching my video i'm not going to say your name but we went to marksville and i preached praise God and the Lord kind of moved really I mean people come, came to the altar they asked for prayer and things of that nature and so anyway he said a, he said a couple of things to me first of all I said something about I was going to run a marathon he said going to run a marathon man look at that gut <laughs> anyway, that's what he said but, but anyway this is what he said I said well how do you think you went today pastor maybe I shouldn't have asked him maybe I should have just asked the Holy Spirit I, you know, I'll take the correction he said he said, man, you don't fit in nobody's mold. He said, you teach like a Baptist and preach like a Pentecostal. I said, fit in somebody's mold? Like, you think that, and I, just, I did tell him this. I said, you think that I'm looking to fit into a mold? I'm not looking to fit into a mold, brother. I'm looking to crunch mold. I'm looking to break mold. I'm not looking to live for God or teach for God or preach for God or live for God according to the tradition of of men. I see John the Baptist was full of zeal and he prepared the way of the Lord. I see Elijah the Tishbite was full of zeal and he prepared the way that God's will could be done in the land. And I don't know what he's called you to do, but I believe he's called me to provoke people by the Spirit of God, by the Word of God to say, hey, it's time that Jesus gets his glory. Amen. And he's coming back soon and he wants you and I to live here. He wants you and I 
to exalt him. And I think that we exalted him this morning. Amen. Amen. I can really and truly, we could, we could probably go home. Because I came here with one intent in my heart was to exalt Jesus. And we did it. And I thank you for joining in and, and let us exalt him. Amen. Praise God. He's worthy. So, so the, the refiner's fire and the fuller's soap. So the idea here is that it's the, the idea of purging and cleansing. Back in the old ancient days, in order to get the precious metals out, there was something called a refiner. Yeah. And the refiner would use fire and oxygen with the bellows and blow the oxygen to stoke the fire. And they had ways that they could make pottery out of various materials that could handle like 16, 1800 degrees. And they would take that uh, lead ore and various type of ore that was non-precious metals and they would put it in this encasement. They'd stoke the fire and as the fire got burned hotter and hotter, then the, all of the dross, which was the Purities would come rise to the top. Yesterday morning I was praying and, I, and all of a sudden the Lord began to move upon my heart as I was praying and part of the, what he brought up some of what was in this message and he was speaking to me about the dross and that the dross was the impurities that would settle way down at the bottom and that the Lord was revealing to me and or just reminding me really that many that in our lives the dross is like those impurities that settle way down on the inside of our heart and sometimes they're forgotten and we don't even realize that those things are there hurts from the past anger from the past sins of the past that we never really brought to the Lord and never really let him deal with and the Lord was saying no my refiner's fire is going to move in and I'm going to stoke the flame and I'm going to cause the impurities to be revealed and my refiner's fire if you'll let me it'll find every hidden chamber of the heart every hidden Good. thing that's hiding on the inside and brothers and sisters I got to tell you Pastor Matt's not the only one that's had dross laying at the bottom of his heart Pastor Matt's not the only one that has had hidden things in the chambers of his heart. No, the people of God have had hidden things in the chambers of their heart. And the Lord is coming back for a bride without spot or blemish. He wants to purify his bride. He wants to put the refiner's fire yes. on his bride because he wants to remove those impurities because he loves her so much. Awesome. Amen. The fuller's soap. They, they would have something called a fuller's field. They would make this ash out of something called salt wort. In the Hebrew, the word was kali, and that's where we get the word alkali. And so that's how they would make lye, if I'm not mistaken. That's how they would make soap. And they'd have a system of washing with water, and they'd take that fuller's soap in the fuller's field because it kind of stunk because the chemicals and whatnot. And they would take these garments that were dirty, and they would take the wool from the sheep, and they would, and, and it was a process where they would put the soap on it, and they put it in the water, and then people would have to tread on it, just like they did in a wine press to agitate it, to get the dirt to get loosened, to begin to remove the dirt, and then they'd have to put the soap back on it, and they dump it again, and they tread it, and it was a process where they had to work with it to get all that dirt and all of that nastiness. And as I was praying, the Lord reminded me that many times the enemy he comes to bring accusations, yeah. just like he did to Joshua the high priest in the book of Zechariah. The word of God says that Joshua was standing there with dirty garments and Satan was at his right hand accusing him. And the word of God says in the book of Revelation that Satan is the accuser of the brethren and that he accuses us day and night. But the Lord brought cleansing. The Lord clothed Zechariah with clean garments. And I'm here to tell you this morning, the blood of Jesus is like the refuller yeah. soap. The blood of Jesus brings the cleansing. Amen. And he will make us white as snow. He said to the prophet Isaiah, he said, though their sin, though your sins be like scarlet and crimson, they will be made white like snow and wool. I'm here to tell you this morning, there's no sin so dirty. There's no, there's nothing that you've gone so far that the blood of Jesus cannot cleanse and purify. He wants you to know that this morning. Amen. Don't let the devil bring an accusation against you in the courtrooms of God. That's right. Oh, no, he's going to bring an accusation, but you got to plea. You understand that? You got to plea. You, you got to plea. You got to plea of righteousness, my friend. 
You, you believe that? Yes. You believe that this morning? Yeah. You have a plea of righteousness before your God. But let me tell you something. You better not try to stand up there in your own righteousness, right? No, the plea of your righteousness is really the plea of the blood. And when the enemy comes and he accuses you and he comes against you, you know what? I plead the blood, Lord. I plead the blood. There's nothing hidden from your eyes. You've seen it all. Right? You, you, you got the eye. You can you see it all, Lord God. But I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Listen, you're not supposed to be walking around under condemnation and guilt. The enemy wants to try to burden you down with condemnation and guilt. You ran well. Who did hinder you? The enemy wants to put weights and burdens on you so that you can't run the race. I'm here to tell you that God wants to free you from the burdens and the weights that have tried to hold you down so that you could not be the person that God called you to be. The Lord wants to set you free. Amen. The question is, will we let him set us free? Amen. So the repeated heating removed the dross. Heating, removing, heating, removing until finally it was purified like pure silver. Amen. And, and then the fuller soap removed the dirt. Washing, rinsing, treading, washing, rinsing. Tre you know, part of the process of, of, of becoming refined and purified are the trials of life. Yeah. You, you, know, you know, the enemy wants to make you think you wasted your life. The enemy wants to make you think about the last eight years, the last 14 years, the last four years. And he wants to try to remind you, look what you wasted. Look what you look at you. You're worthless. You're hopeless. I'm here to tell you right now, the Lord can speak things to you in the midst of the valley. That, that prepare you for the mountaintop. The Lord wants you to know that just like Joseph, who ended up being betrayed and thrown into a pit by his brothers, sold into slavery, lied upon by Potiphar's wife, ends up in a prison, forgotten in the prison, but yet at the same time when those same brothers that lied on him and sold him into slavery showed back up in the midst of the famine, Joseph said, you don't know, have to say another word. He didn't say that, but that's what... You don't know, have to say another word. What you meant for evil, God has turned around for good. The enemy thought he had you. The enemy thought he had you. But I'm going to tell you, if you're Christian, if you're a true believer, the enemy doesn't get the last say-so. And you, and if the Lord sets you free, you need to serve him. You need to serve him. And you need to thank him for the rest of your life. Amen. That's what I believe. That's what I believe right there. Amen. So that spiritual refinement. He wants to get, he wants to get rid of that, that mixture of, the, of that lead that's in there. That tin that's in there. Right? The impurities that are interconnected with the precious metals. And he wants to, he wants to continue to do that work. Now let's take a look at uh, Mark chapter 9 verses 2 through 3 if you could if you could switch over to the King James version for me that would be good mark chapter 9 verses 2 through 3 I hope y'all don't get too upset that I switched between translations but it's because I'm actually spending a lot of time and trying to figure out specific words that I believe give the best translation of what's really the Lord saying through the Holy Spirit that's what I'm trying to do when I do that I just want you to know Okay. So it says, uh, and after six days, Jesus, is this the King James? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his raiment, which means his clothing or his garment became shining exceeding white as snow so as no fuller on earth can white them so what he's saying is the NASB uses the word no launderer on earth could get them that white and so that's what it's talking about it's talking about the fuller's soap See, fuller soap couldn't get the garment that Jesus was wearing the, and the white that was coming off of Jesus the, no, there's no soap that was made that could have made that could have made him that white 
You know, Peter didn't understand what happened right here. He writes about it later in, in, second, in 1 Peter chapter 2. He remembers this occurrence. Because see, at this moment in time, what was in Jesus right there, the deity of God. Jesus is God who became flesh. And listen to me. Whenever Jesus walked the earth, he did not go back and forth between being God and being man. No, he came to make right with the first man made wrong. That's why the Bible calls him the last Adam. So I don't, I'm not trying to be rude, but I just want to make a point. I want to make this point right here. Whenever we say, I'm not Jesus, and we expect to fail, we are already failing, God. That is not appropriate because I'm here to tell you that Jesus operated through the power of the Holy Spirit that was on the inside of him. Jesus, in order to make right what the first Adam made wrong, had to die as a man because God cannot die. Yet he never stopped being God on earth, but he chose not to exhibit his deity. He instead lived his life as humanity and allowed the Holy Spirit of God to heal through him, perform miracles through him, and to raise the dead through yes, him. Yes. Amen. And he was, and, and therefore he was able to die. The Father gave him the permission. The Father gave him the commandment that he would be able to lay his life down and pick it back up again. No man took Jesus' life. Right. He willingly laid his yes, life down yes. for you. Right. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And so, so, but it says that he was transfigured before them. And that word in the Greek, and we've taught on this before, is where we get our English word metamorphosis. That tr transformation taking place, something that was internal in him became evident outwardly. Those that were around him were able to see the internal nature of what Jesus was and who Jesus was. It was come out of him. Amen. And, and the reflection of that. And they were able to see that with their visible eyes. Now, I got I to gotta tell you that there's another scripture uh, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2. And it says this in the King James. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want you to know that the word transformed in that text right there is the same exact Greek word as transfigured. And what it's saying is, is that there's something on the inside of you. Now, I got to tell you, we've been talking about this a lot lately, but if you are a born again, converted Christian this morning, the word of God says that the God of glory lives on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit is one with your spirit. Je Jesus said it. In John chapter 14, he would pray to the Father. He would send another comforter whom the world did not know, but they knew him because he had been with them, but he was going to be in them. When Jesus died on the cross and paid the penalty for sin, then the, the sin was able to be removed when you put faith in the Lord and the Holy Spirit moved on the inside of you. I'm here to tell you, God lives on the inside of you. So we don't have any more excuses to say, well, I'm not Jesus. No, I'm here to tell you that you and I need to learn how to yield to the Lord. We need to learn what the word of God says, and we need to let God start living his life through us. We need to let God start manifesting his life through us. So this idea of metamorphosis, is there a better example in creation of our God than the butterfly? You know, in that that little grub worm, that little earth dweller, right, crawling around on the earth, is is some kind of a genetic DNA that says one day. Yes. I mean, I mean, you're not really getting any better than this. I'm not trying to overdo the illustration, but it means spun up in a cocoon like a tomb, yeah. to where that thing dies, 
And then it comes out a completely different creation looking thing. And the scripture says that you died with Christ. You were buried with him. And a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. And the scripture says that, listen, those that are in Christ, behold, old things have passed away and all things have been made new. And you went from being an earth dweller and crawling around on the ground to where now you have a vision, the heavenly vision, because the word of God says that you're seated in Christ in heavenly places. And the scripture says that you've been given the mind of Christ. Amen. And that if you yield to the truth of God's word he'll give you his knowledge, he'll give you his wisdom, he'll give you his understanding and you'll see this world in a whole different yeah, way because Jesus right. told Nicodemus if you'd be born again you could see the kingdom of God and you'll also enter into the kingdom of God, he's going to give you eyes to see, amen. He's trying to elevate us and give us a different vision, amen. The vision that can say, you know what? My brother or sister might be mad at me right now. They might say something to me, but I can forgive. Amen. I can forgive because, listen, you know, or somebody at work might treat me wrong, but you know what? I can learn to get past that because Jesus, look what they did to Jesus. Look, and Jesus is in me, and I'm one with him. Amen. I can learn to get past me. The apostle Paul said you don't war or wrestle against flesh and blood. You're in a fight with spiritual entities. But God, Jesus said this, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. He's trying to refine us and purge us to get us to the place where we can see like he sees. Amen. Praise God. So he was transfigured, He was, and we are transformed. But both of us have been metamorphed. I don't think that's a real word, but I like it. <laughs> so there's not a better example in creation than the butterfly, but let me ask you this. Is there a better statement than the words of our Lord? Luke chapter 6, verse 45. Now this is a mirror for your soul, my friend. It's a mirror for my soul. It's a mirror for Matt A. Bear. Okay, look what it says. This is our Lord speaking. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. Look at this. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Ooh. Does that make you feel kind of funny on the inside? Praise the Lord. Yeah, it's the Amen. truth though. Because look, there's something like, like whatever's in there. It, it's visible by when it comes out. Yes, yes. And so now we need that what that's telling us is that we need to pay attention to how we sound. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to pay attention about the words. But look, let me just say this. It's got to be a work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's got to do the work yes. on the inside of our heart. And He does that. That's the beauty of the new covenant walk with God. That when Jesus, listen, how many times do I got to say it today? Five, ten maybe? That'd probably be good. That when Jesus died on the cross, see, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. That's right. The Old Testament sacrifices were painting a picture for the day when Jesus would come. But the Bible says that when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was split in two, providing access into the Holy of Holies, which gives us access to the presence of God. And now when you take your faith and put faith in Christ and his sacrifice, the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of you and you become the temple of the living God. God. And so when you and I learn to submit to that truth, grace flows. Amen. Grace flows from the Holy Spirit and begins to transform the inside of who we are. He begins to produce that butterfly on the inside of us. He begins to produce that image of Jesus on the inside of us. And even though you treat me wrong with time, and even though you say wrong stuff with time, I'm going to begin to learn. I'm going to begin to learn that I can walk a different way and I can respond a different way. And not only that, I'm not talking about fake it till you make it, my friend. I'm talking about true love from the Holy Spirit doing surgery on my yes, heart, yes. transforming me and changing me and healing me on the inside Amen. to where I can truly love you. I tried to do that Wednesday night whenever I did that little, um, that little, you know, whatever that was. It was supposed to be an illustration. And I got all these people up here. I had four people facing this way. 
four people facing that way. And I was talking about the woman with the issue of blood and how she had to press through the crowd to get to the hem of Jesus' garment. Right. And then I talked about the woman with the alabaster box. And there was a couple of different scenarios, but in one of them, the Pharisee says if he knew what kind of woman that was, he wouldn't let her touch him, right? And I thought about the fact that she knew he was in the house. And I'm telling you right now, that house was filled with people. It was filled with his disciples, but it was filled with other people in there. And I don't know if you've ever walked into a situation before where you've seen religious folk. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Can you, you know what a religious face looks like? In medicine, we call it faces. They're, they're fa like F-A-C-I-E-S. They had a depressed faces, right? Okay, they had a certain fate, a certain look. Okay. But, but have you ever seen a religious spirit face? He's not, you can start determining a little bit about what kind of spirit somebody's dealing with. You can see pride in people's faces. You can see depression or oppression in people's faces. You can see it, dude. People wear it. At least that's what the Lord is showing me now. See, you used to use it in medicine. Now I'm going to try to teach you how to use it in the spirit realm. And you can start to see whenever people are conflicted and they ain't right. And the Lord knows people are like, yeah, Pastor, I saw you last week. You was anger face. Okay. Right? Help us, Lord. Help us. But what I'm trying to say is this. If you've ever been in a situation where there's a whole bunch of religious folk, I am supposed to be speaking about refiner's fire this morning. None of this stuff I've talked about so far is really in my notes. But anyway, they got, they got the people with religious look on their face. Yes. And, and it's so uncomfortable when you walk into that yes. scenario. Please, please, if we get new people that come into the church, don't don't be carrying a religious look on your face. Amen. Hey, try to smile at people and <laughs> tell them that you're glad that they're here. Yes. Yes. But can you imagine that girl? That girl? That was a year's worth of wage. I didn't mean to preach on her. I didn't know I was going to go here. But like she said, I got to get to Jesus. And I don't know about all these other people right here, but I got I got to get to Jesus because you see Jesus did something for her that I don't know for sure that we really know exactly what it was. At some point in the journey, he ran across her path and he touched her life, and she was never the same. And there wasn't no religious spirit gonna keep that girl away from washing his feet, from 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 anointing him for his burial. She said, well, "Thank you very much. I'm coming through, and I'm gonna end up at the feet of Jesus." Jesus, right? That's what I'm going to do. And listen, and, and, and you got to be careful because you can be sitting in a church and you can say, but I love Jesus. Yeah, well, guess what? Let people love Jesus the way they want to love Jesus. If they want to be quiet, love Jesus. Let them be quiet, love Jesus. If they want to run around the church, hallelujah. Because he is worthy yes. to be run around the church about. Amen. He is worthy Amen. to be spoken of in public places. Yes. Come on, somebody. Help me out. I ain't got no time for no more religious spirit yes. trying to throttle the people of God and tell them how they got to worship. Tell them how long they can worship. Tell them, you know, what it got to look like. No, 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 no. The worship for Jesus needs to be extravagant. Hallelujah. He's worthy. Thank you, Lord. He's worthy. Amen. So look, the people even in the Old Testament, they knew. But before we get into that, I wanted to, one of the things that I was supposed to talk about is that in that scripture of Luke 645, where it talks about that out of the heart, the, the, the mouth speaks the abundance of the heart. Right? The mouth speaks the abundance of the heart. And that whenever... We're talking about the refiner's fire and the fuller's soap. What we got to understand, if any of you in this place have ever ran from God before, mm -hmm. you know. He And listen, once you come back to him, I'm telling you right now, somebody the other day told me, I was listening to that preacher in every word. It was like the Lord was scratching my heart. I thought that was one of the best illustrations. Just scratching at my heart. And can I tell you something that the Lord's not okay with just a little bit of you? Can you get a little sound on this right here? On this mic, I can't tell if I'm on this. Give me a little test mic. There we go. All right, praise God. And so, so whenever, whenever he, whenever you begin to ask him to move on your heart, he, he's not, he's not gonna give up until he gets it all. Yeah. Do you understand that that he wants all of you? That's it. And do you understand that he's worthy to have all of you? I want you to understand that. Some people, I know Angie said that the other day. She's like, man, some people may not like Pastor Matt. They think he's just way a little bit too extreme. Yeah, I wasn't always like this. And, and I mean, but this is the thing. Like, he's worthy of, of, of like extreme worship. 
He's worthy. He, you know, it's pretty extreme what he did for us. Amen. Anyway, I'm going on too much. I wanted to give this mic to you because that song you sang Wednesday night, and I know I think Shelby might sing it too, but you sang it Wednesday night, so it's kind of fresh on your heart. But uh, I won't. You won't give up until you have it all. And you can hold on to the mic. And I just want you to start, huh? You won't give up until you, you won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. You won't relent until you have it all. My heart is yours. Sing another verse. I'll sit you as a seal upon my heart as a seal upon my arm. Where there is there is a strongest death, jealousy demanding as a grave. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes. So what I wanted you to see there is, is that he won't relent until he has it all. That's good. What, you got to understand something. You can try to run from the Lord. You can get on an airplane and move to Singapore. But if you ever said, Lord, I want to be yours, he's going to chase yes. you. He's going to follow you. Yes. And he's not going to relent. And, and he Amen. wants it all, my friend. Amen. Amen. He's not looking just for a little bit. He wants you and I to truly give our life over. That's the word of God. That's the will yes. of God that we would lay our life down just like he laid his life down. Because until we do that, he really can't operate through us the way that he, the way that he planned. The word of God says in Galatians 2.20, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but he liveth in me. Now this life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, he wants to use my life to live through. He wants to live through me to minister to other people. But if I'm running away from him and I'm not allowing him to have his way, if I'm not allowing the refiner to stoke the fire, if I'm not allowing the dross when it's revealed, see, because the trial and the tribulation is like the bellows of oxygen that are pumping and making the fire hotter. And in the midst of the fiery furnace, what happens is, is that the impurities and the dross are revealed. And you can keep looking around at your neighbor. Go ahead. I mean, you don't have to right now. You can if you want. You can look at your neighbor and say, the boy's preaching to you. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying, cuz? Or friend? Look. <laughs> cuz. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what I'm saying, my friend? He's pre preacher got your number. No, 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 no. Preacher got your number. Preacher got his own number. Amen. You got stuff. You got draw settled in the bottom of your heart, my friend. And and look, the Lord's trying to get the flame stoked so that stuff will start coming up. So that when we see it, we can say, Lord, you need to put the cross on that right there. That right there needs to die. Hallelujah. It ain't just you, sis, but praise God, that's a good place to start. Amen. It's a good place to start. Because look, look, I'm gonna be honest with you, dude. I was in like most of y'all know my story. I was in three rehabs by the time I was 19. I've been telling everybody at urgent care. I'm a nurse practitioner and I've been telling everybody, look, y'all gotta hear my story. Not every single one of them, but most of them. Yeah, praise God. Look, I was sitting on an air conditioner outside a triple quick convenience store at 17 years old, waiting for somebody to come get me higher on Johnston Street. High school dropout. Uh, maybe I did. Oh, Lord. I did. Thank you, God. I'm sorry. Well, thank God we're doing a testing. Remind me never. We're just doing a test today. Thank you, Rich. Sorry about that. I was trying to give it to Yeah, you can hear me, but if we go to digital, they wouldn't have been able to hear me. Anyway, crazy. So, so, look. So, in the midst of that, God changes, folks. I done lost my train of thought, but that's okay. Maybe I wasn't supposed to go there. Huh? On yeah, I knew I was sitting on the AC, but I don't know why I was sitting on the AC. I'm not going to lie, but I know I went back to the AC. 
Because people need to hear the life changing power of Jesus. Amen. Yes, yes. And I'm tired. I'm telling you right now, I'm tired of religion, dude. And I'm not going to apologize for it. Religion is holding people in bondage. Amen. Listen, I was born into religion, and I'm sorry. Religion tries to prevent the real Jesus from showing yeah. up. Yeah. Religion don't want the real Jesus to show up because because when the real Jesus shows up, people start breaking out of bondage, yeah. and the devil wants people to stay in bondage. Right. And it's not just the, the denominations that you're thinking. It's Pentecostal denominations yeah. sometimes are full of religion. Yeah. Charismatic denominations are full of religion. Spirit of religion tries to get on top of people and tell people that they can't, what they can do, what they can't do, what they can watch, what they can't watch. Then look, I'm going to tell you, you can watch what you want, but you better learn what the truth of the word of God says. And you better be able to compare it to what you're listening to. Because yeah. there's a whole lot of stuff out there that will twist you off and get you messed up. Anyway. So he won't relent until you have it all. You know, and, and even in the Old Testament, like the people of God have always wanted God's, their heart to be right before God. I mean, tr the true followers of God. Right. And because look at what the psalmist said. So so this is the cry of those that belong to him. Psalm 26, two. You don't even have to go there. But look, he said, examine me, O Lord. Prove me. Try my reins and my heart. We preached on that. Remember that about the Old Testament sacrifices and how they had to cut it open and flay it open. And they have to dig in there. Some of you nursing students, some of you nurses in here. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Biology majors. Y'all know what they had? They have to pull the intestines out and search for tumors because see the Old Testament sacrifice as a type of Jesus had to not be able to have any obvious blemishes or tumors on the inside because Jesus was the sinless lamb of God that was foreordained before the, the, the foundation of the earth. And so they had to inspect every one of those animal sacrifices. And so when the psalmist says, try my reins, that's an old English word talking about like the call and the liver and, and, and removing those, those internal organs and looking around and doing an inspection in there. And so that's what the psalmist is saying. Try my reins, Lord. Try my heart. Put me to the test. Whatever you see in there, reveal to me. Put the refiner's fire on it. Psalm 66, 10. For thou, O God, has proved us or put us to the test. Thou has tried us as silver is tried. Yes. Isaiah chapter 1, look. See, the Lord says that a mixture of righteousness and sin is not going to work anymore. I'm telling you right now, we are in the last days, my friend. That's another thing I've been telling almost everybody I've talked to. People, if they say they're not saved, I know I've been telling y'all that. I'm like, what you think about this world? Dude, it's going crazy. Everybody knows it. And I had a conversation with somebody last Thursday, and I was like, well, what you think this is all about? Like, okay, the world's going crazy. You believe in a new world order. I had a 13-year-old girl that was sitting there talking, I told you, mama, I told you. Like, every day, all these people know, but, but are we going to Jesus? Do we realize that the whole grand deception, the whole point to this whole Illuminati garbage stuff that we talk about in the music industry and all these kinds of things, yes, it's real. It's because they done sold their soul to the devil. And why would they do such a thing? Because the devil's real and he gives power on earth and God is going to destroy him and all those that put their partnership with him. It's coming, my friend. It is on the, I don't know when, but it's on the brink. And now is the time for us to wake up. Paul said 2,000 years ago, we're nearer now to our salvation than when we first began. The day is creeping up ever so quickly. Now is the time for us to let the refiner's fire and the fuller's yes. soap have his way. God does not want a mixture. He's not looking for an alloy. An alloy is a mixture of different metals, non-precious along with precious. He don't want no more tin up in his silver. He wants to remove those things. Right. He said it in, in uh, Isaiah 1 and 25, the NASB version. He said this. I will also turn my hand against you and will smelt away your dross as with lye, and I will remove all your alloy. Yes. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the conviction of your Holy Spirit. You know, this is one thing I do want you to know is this, is that in the new covenant, the Holy Spirit in you is according to Philippians chapter 2, 
verse 13. It is God which works in you both to will and to do yes. according to his good pleasure. Yes. See, the Holy Spirit does a transformation miracle on the inside of your heart. And what ends up happening is he begins to put it on the inside of you for you to begin to have the desire to yes. do the will of God. Yes. Yes. See, when you're sometimes even as a person that loves God. Okay. Now I know what Jesus said. He, he, Jesus, he throws us some, no, he don't throw curveballs. He just throws straight up fastballs. Yeah. Right. And he says, okay, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. Keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my I'm going to do that. I provided the way. I, I died on the cross That's for right. you. Yes. You have grace yes. flowing into your life. Grace is power from the Holy Spirit to strengthen you and to embolden and to give you the power that you need to live right before you. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so when the Holy Spirit is in you, the Holy Spirit is giving you both the will and the power to Amen. do Amen. according yes. to God's Thank good you. pleasure. Jesus. So that means that we need to quit running off and doing whatever we used to do Amen. by the grace of God. Now listen, I'm not over here trying to preach sinless perfection to you. Okay, there was only one man that was perfect on the face of the earth. His name was Jesus. But what I am trying to say is this, is that those that truly love the Lord and want to serve the Lord, that every time you run away, I'm just here to tell you, he will not relent until he has it all. Right. And you can keep running, but he's going to keep chasing. That's Amen. Right. And sooner or later, he's going to get you backed up into a situation to where, you you know what I'm saying, where you're going to want to yield. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Um, one of Second Timothy chapter two verses uh, nineteen through twenty two says this: Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. I love this. The Lord knows those who yes, are His, yes. and everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain. This is the NASB. I don't know what we got up here. Uh, abstain from wickedness. And he goes on to say this in verse 20. Some vessels are, are vessels to honor. Okay. And some are vessels of dishonor. And I don't know about you, but I want to be, it says in a big house that there's vessels of honor and there's also vessels of dishonor. So that means in the church, like there could be people that are not necessarily truly saved. It's possible, right? I hope that's not any of you in here today. You, 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 word of God says you, you must be born again. Yes. Okay. But in a church, there could be people that are not really saved, but are talking the lingo. You ever been around that before where they talk Christianese, but they're, but what they're saying is not lining up or the way that they're behaving is not lining up or even the way that they talk about the Bible. Listen, I'm not trying to talk. Every last one of us, including Pastor Matt, has said things that he shouldn't have said, and you know it. And you don't have to come tell me after church, oh, yeah, Pastor Matt, what about, you know, da, da, da. you don't have to tell me. I know. Okay, I, I get it. But what I'm trying to say is this, is that they're, we're either saved or we're not. And it, sometimes it just don't sound right. Somebody the other day said, said they were talking to somebody at work, and they, and they were giving them the gospel. And the person said, man, I believe everything that you just said. And they were like, eh, I don't think you do, buddy. He's like, what? And I think the guy started cussing. Blankety blank, what? <laughs> and he's like, no, you don't believe it. Because look, this is the thing. If you believed it, like if you believed you could fly, you would go, you wouldn't want to show me. If you believed you could fly, you wouldn't want to show me. You'd go up on top of a building and you'd take off and you'd start soaring in the air because you'd want to prove that to me. But see, the fruit that's coming out of your mouth isn't lining up with what the scripture says. And the reality of it is this, is that there's a difference between a person that is a true convert that's struggling and doesn't always sound like Jesus versus somebody that's just talking a language and is not truly converted and born again. And the Holy Spirit gives us discernment to know the difference. But what I'm, my main point to all of this is this, is that the Holy Spirit wants to bring the refiner's fire. Amen. Yes. Praise God. So look, I want you to let's let's take a look at some truth, okay? Some 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 apostolic truth. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Let's take a look at this in the NASB version. And I want you to see verse 23. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know, one of the things that I think really set me free when I first started preaching, because a lot of times people get mad nowadays when you talk about sin. 
or if you talked about the cross and they feel like you're beating them up and they, why you, why, you know, no, 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 you got to understand something. This is the truth. We were all born in sin. We, according to the Bible, we were all born of Adam. We were all born sinners. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. Yes. Okay. And so all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All right. But then he says this, being justified. This is the NASB version. Being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, let me ask you a question. And I'm, we're making this interactive to this morning. Can anybody tell me the definition of justified? Declared righteous. Declared legally innocent. Praise God. Said, yes. She said declared righteous. Sean said declared legally innocent. The, the, the main sticking point that I wanted you to understand is this, is that it's a little bit different than just righteous. See, what Jesus did when he died on the cross for you and your faith in that is what allows you to be righteous. Now you have right standing. It's because of what Jesus did, not what you do. Many times people try to, to live a life of righteousness through their works. They try to be righteous in the eyes of God because they read a lot of the Bible. You're supposed to read the Bible, by the way. They, they try to be righteous by how much they go to church. They try to be righteous by feeding the poor. The hungry, they try to, you are, it's good to feed the hungry. Jesus said to feed the hungry. They try to be righteous by clothing the naked. Jesus said to clothe the naked. But that's not, you can't earn righteousness with God. That's why Jesus, that's why the Father had to send Jesus to die on the cross. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, I believe, it says that Jesus is righteous. It doesn't say it exactly like that, but that's what the text is saying. That righteousness has a name, and his name is Jesus. All right. So Jesus' death on the cross paid the penalty for sin, and he did that for the whole world. But when you came to the place in your life where you really meant business with God, I mean, I don't know when you really got saved, but I'll tell you this. When you did get saved, it's because you really did. You bowed your heart to him. You didn't just give lip service, but you bowed your heart to him. And when that happened, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you. And the Bible teaches that now you've been clothed in the righteousness of Jesus because I've preached this before. The great exchange took place where he took your guilt on the cross and he gave you the gift of his righteousness right so that's what righteousness is yes. right standing with God is that you have been given as a gift Jesus's righteousness Hallelujah. justification is God saying Yep, that's exactly what I planned right there. Yeah. You finally lined up with me. Hallelujah. Yeah. So now I declare you righteous. And if God be for you, somebody got to tell me yeah. who's going to be against you. Yeah. Look, what voice? The, look, the Lord going to condemn every mouth that comes against you. Listen, people from your past are never going to be able to let you live it down. They're going to be, oh, you were a harlot. You were a fornicator. You were an adulterer. You were a drug. You were an alky. You were this. You were you were whatever you were. I'm here to tell you right now, they're liars. The Bible says you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. But you better quit looking to add stuff to your Jesus. Everybody's trying to add something to Jesus. I'll take my Jesus and this. I'll take my Jesus and this. No, it's either Jesus all or Jesus none. God doesn't bankrupt in heaven of its most prized possession. And now we're going to try to add something to our Jesus. Lord, help us. Help us. So you've been justified. You've been declared innocent by God. And it's a gift. And it comes through his grace. But through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So redemption is a payment price. What was the payment price? Y'all shouted it on the count of three. One, two, three. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The redemption price was the blood of Jesus. Praise God. And, and he goes on to say this in Romans 3 and 25. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. That's how I like to say that. Some people say propitiation, but it, to me, it's like it's supposed to be like initiation. God 
whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. See, there had to be a day of reckoning where God's justice was going to be satisfied because of the sin of the human race. And what God did was he publicly put Jesus as the payment for that penalty. Right, right. Now that word propitiation has got two meanings to it. Number one, it's literally the Greek word there means mercy seat. Okay. Now, if you know anything about the mercy seat, once a year, they would put blood on top of the mercy seat once a year, turning it from a place of judgment to mercy. So literally, the Apostle Paul, knowing that, is saying, Jesus is your mercy seat. Amen. Even though you broke the law of God, even though you were against God, even though you were guilty, Jesus is your mercy seat. And now in God's mind, you're free from your sin. Amen. But number two, it also satisfies the wrath of God. That word propitiation means the wrath of God is satisfied. What I'm telling you is this. And look, I was sharing this with this Matilda this morning. The Lord reminded me, I was studying this, I don't know, yesterday or something. And he reminded me of that verse where it says, it pleased him to bruise him. Oh, it just, it just grabbed a hold of my heart because all of a sudden I had this visual of Jesus being thrown down, of Jesus being whipped, of Jesus being blindfolded, of them ripping the hair out of his beard, of them laughing at him, of him hanging Naked. And I kept going back to that word because it was, it was kind of, I think it was bothering me for me. And the word pleased meant it brought pleasure. It brought pleasure to the Father to bruise Jesus. It brought pleasure to the Father for Jesus to be crushed because it was on my behalf. Because God loved you so much and he loved me so much that it pleased him to allow that to happen to his only begotten son. To the one who was the only one that ever did it right. And I don't know, it just hit me in another, in another way. Like, it was just like, oh, because it was like, <laughs> it pleased you to bruise him for me. And even this morning, you know, I try not to, I do, I pray with the mic, but I try not to do it too loud. I was like, Lord, I'm sorry. I, like Daniel prayed for Israel and repented for Israel. Believe me, I, got, I ain't as righteous as Daniel, but I'm just saying. I repent, Lord. I repent that you, Jesus, had to be bruised for me. I repent, Lord, for the, for the church that has turned against you, the part of the church that's turned against you, whoever that is. I repent, Lord, for this nation that has turned against you. I repent, Lord, for this world that has turned against you, Lord. Mm -hmm. you, were, you were bruised and you willingly allowed it to happen. And, you know, that's part of the refiner's fire and the fuller's so having it <coughs> in our heart that we realize we quit, we quit staring at our neighbor and thinking, man, I just wish he'd grab a hold of what this preacher's talking about. You know, if you just get a little revelation of what he's talking about, we'd be able to get along better. No, like we got to come to the place where we understand he was bruised because of you. Yes. He was bruised because of you back there. Yeah. You know, he, he, it was because of us that he was bruised. And it pleased the Father because that's how much he loves you. Amen. Singers, musicians, y'all can come forward. You know, in the end... Um, there's a scripture out of Ephesians 5, and it says, Husbands, love your wives, right? But this is where I want to start. Not that I'm belittling that, because it's important. But even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it, why? That he might sanctify or make it holy, that he might cleanse it with the washing of the water of the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church. That word glorious has the idea of splendor, the glory of God. Amen. That he wants her to be without spot, without wrinkle or, or any such thing that she would be holy and without blemish. And in that message that I started off with, you know, I want to just remind you that God is refining and preparing a bride for himself. But this is what I wanted to share with you this morning. 
The bride has to submit to the washing. Come on. Oh, Lord. She got it. I wrote it right here. I know it sounds a little bit weird, but she has to position herself in the bathtub of grace. The bride of Jesus, if you if that's you this morning, have, you, we have to position ourselves in a place where we allow the Holy Spirit to refine our hearts, to purge us, to put the fuller soap on our heart. We have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Amen. It, there's two last thoughts that I want to talk about. In Acts chapter 17, actually going back to Romans 3.25, he said, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously. In other words, he didn't judge it right then and there. But when he sent Jesus is when he really judged it. Amen. And in Acts chapter 17, if you'll remember this story, the apostle Paul was in Athens and he was preaching to the Athenians and they just were so smart. They, they knew everything. And, and, and this is what the Apostle Paul ends up telling him. He says, in the past, God overlooked. In other words, he, was, he had forbearance. He overlooked the times of ignorance. But this is what he said. Now, God is declaring to men that all people, everywhere, should repent. Because he has fixed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man who he has appointed. And he furnished the proof because he raised him. Right? And then the Apostle Peter says this, and I'm closing with this last scripture. And I just want to give us a, a moment to worship, amen, to worship the Lord, to get along with God, even if it's in your seat, up in the altar, to, to do business with the Lord and to at least say a prayer where you ask God to begin to allow the refiner's fire to touch your heart, that he would apply the soap to your heart, amen. But Peter said this in 1 Peter 4, 17 through 18. He said, for it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Father, thank you for your son, Jesus.